have a double tour portion today. Reason being, we gotta try to squeeze them all in before we go to the feast. <coughs> um, the first one is called We Alek. Um, this one. <coughs> Okay, this one means, this is just one chap. this is one only one chapter too, this is chapter uh, 31 of Deborim or Deuteronomy. Um, it means, and he went, you know, and of course we know that's usually, Torah portions are usually the first sentence, or sometimes the first word of the first verse of the Torah portion, and, and uh, that's Deborim, um, chapter 31, and it reads, verse 1 reads, And Moshe went, and spoke all the words to all Israel. So on this Torah portion, this is kind of like uh, Moshe's last pep talk before the children of Israel go into the, enter the land with uh, Yahoshua, Joshua. <coughs> and uh, he kind of gives instructions again. He repeat, This is stuff he's been repeating, right? He's giving them instructions on what to do when you get there, right? <coughs> and assures them, again, have no fear, which you hear him say throughout the whole thing constantly. Have no fear, right? <coughs> Because, as you know, as he tells them, it, you've seen, right? Yahweh's with you, so there shouldn't be any fear. <coughs> then around uh, verse 7, Moses, this is when uh, Moshe tells Joshua he's going to be the new leader. <coughs> he's going to the one, he's gonna be the one to take the children of Israel into the land to lead them. <coughs> and again, you know, have no fear. <coughs> and then uh, around verses 10 through 13, this is when we see um, Moshe mention that uh, in the seventh year, in the year of release, in the seven year cycle, you're supposed to uh, read the book of uh, Deuteronomy during the Feast of Tabernacles or Sukkot. <coughs> and, uh, but the seventh year is also a year of release. Like if somebody, uh, if you borrow money to a fellow believer, right? You, uh, if they can't pay you by that seventh year, you have to re release all the debts. And interestingly enough, it says for a foreigner, you're not required to release them from that debt, but you can. It's up to you. It kind of gives you the option. <clears throat> and uh, around verse 16, this is when we see uh, Moshe is about to, knows he's about to die very soon. <clears throat> and, uh, Let's read this verse. I'll read this verse because this is what our subject's going to be about today, right here. In uh, verse 16, it says, of 31, And Yahweh said to Moshe, See, you are about to sleep with your fathers. And that's going to be our topic, what happens after you die. <clears throat> so, then Yahweh tells Moshe, The children of Israel are going to turn from you. You know, he says that uh, they're going to eventually, they're going to turn around, they're going to, worship idols again and and everything else in between so he's telling him ahead of time this is going to happen and we know that happened <coughs> we can see it in the later writings <coughs> and then this is when Yahweh tells Moshe to write a song called the song of Moses and that's uh, a basic summary for that Torah portion and the next Torah portion <coughs> ha as a new as a new it's um Chapter 32, give ear. <coughs> or as we would say, hey, listen up, this is important, right? <coughs> and uh, yeah, this is the song of Moshe. And uh, interestingly enough, we find this again in Revelation 15. I want to read that real quick, just to give some reference to where this is talked about again. <coughs> so Revelation chapter 15, verse 3. Just interesting that you find this more than one place anyway. So Revelation chapter 15, verse 3. <clears throat> or I'll start with one. And I saw another sign in the heaven, great and marvelous. Seven messengers having seven last plagues for the wrath of Elohim was ended in them. And I saw like a sea of glass mixed with fire and those coming, the beast and his image and the mark of his number of his name standing on the sea of glass, holding harps of Elohim. And they sing the song of Moshe, the servant of Elohim, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, El Shaddai, 
Righteous and true are your ways, O sovereign of the set-apart ones. I just thought it was interesting we find that in Revelation too. And I think that brings me to an interesting point I want to bring up. You know, people heard of the mark of the beast and some people think it's a tattoo and stuff. Because he's talking about the mark of the beast there. But we see that uh, Revelation 13, 18 says, you know, here is wisdom. Whoever has understanding, let them calculate the number of the beast, for it's the number of man. And his number is 666, you know, and some manuscripts say 616, but whatever. What we see here, looks like he's talking about man's ways, right? Yahweh's ways and man's ways. Just wanted to point that out while we're going through that. <clears throat> so, anyway, getting back to the Song of Moshe. In uh, verse 2, it reads... Let my instructions fall like rain. My speech drop down as dew, as fine rain on tender plants and showers on the grass. So Moses is making a good point here, you know. This is very important. Let it sink deep. Let it be, let it stick on you like Gorilla Glue. I mean, you get that you're stuck in your fingers, you're, you can't pull that off. So let it, let it sink that deep because it's very important. We can say it with all Yahweh's words, right? <clears throat> Just think Gorilla Glue. <clears throat> so... You know, we got to keep that all his words deeply embedded. And the reason why he's saying that to them is because, like he's, we said earlier, um, Moshe, Yahweh's told Moshe they're going to turn away from you again. They're going to serve idols. They're going to go the way of the nations again. So he's like, this is a fair warning, you know, ahead of time. I'm even telling you what you're going to do. And remember, just keep this in your mind. Be warned when you're tempted to go the wrong way, right? Just like, Just like us, you know. We can take this that same way. We're tempted by things in the world, you know, to, you know, there's a great job here. Don't want to give that up. Or here's a, all my friends and social groups don't give that up, you know. And you're always saying, careful, I'll be tempted by these things, right? We can take that the same way. <clears throat> and then he says, um, after he gives the song of Moshe, you know, Yahweh's going to punish those who don't listen to this warning. And... You know, he gives a fair warning. He gives us plenty of warnings, I think. You know, sometimes they had 400 years of warning before something happened. So the generations of... So ample warning anyway for all these things, you know. <clears throat> and Moshe again says, remember what was taught, right? Keep this in mind again. He just keeps repeating that. Don't forget this. <clears throat> and even teach your children, right? Raise them the way they should go. We see that scriptures more than just here too. <clears throat> And then this is when he tells Moshe, you know, to go up. I know, I forget this. Yep, this is where he mentions it's time for Moses to go up on the, go up on Mount. <clears throat> go up on the mountain. And it's t almost time to die. Almost time for him to die. And that he's not going to pass over because his actions at the Rock of Horeb, right? <clears throat> where he, uh, he was hit the rock, but he was told to speak to it, and he kind of gave himself esteem. You know, he said, "We, how about me and Aaron? Right, me and Aaron will get you rock water out of this rock." And I think that's what he pointed out was the real problem with that. <clears throat> and then that's the end of that Torah portion, <clears throat> or the two Torah portions. A quick summary of those. So the teaching, right? What happens when we die? <clears throat> I think that's uh a subject that probably brings the majority of people to want to understand the scriptures, I'd say. You know, everybody looks around and what's going to happen to sweet grandma? She doesn't want to read a Bible, mom and dad, you know, maybe your children who don't, who've never read one, you know, maybe people who've never paid attention. So that's kind of the purpose of this. <clears throat> so what happens when we die? <clears throat> Which myself obviously was very interested in. <clears throat> so Let's look where I got this from again. And this is in Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 16. <clears throat> All right. And that reads, And Yahweh said to Moshe, You are about to sleep with your fathers. So what does that mean, right? Well, we know when we go to bed at night, you know, we just, it's kind of weird sometimes, but it's, you just all of a sudden you're out. Sometimes you have dreams, but most of the time you just wake up and, 
you know what happened, right? You just fell asleep. But let's see if that's similar to what the scripture says. I mean, let's see what that they actually mean when they say slept with their fathers, right? <coughs> so if you look at this, that word sleep, <coughs> it is in uh, Strong's Hebrew. It is H7901. The word in Hebrew is shakab or shakab. It basically means to lie down, rest, or be still. <coughs> you know, a lot of what we hear, you know, a lot of the main doctrines we hear about when we die is, you know, going to a ever-burning hell, as they say, or or you're immediately in heaven. You wake up and you see an angels or something like that, right? I mean, it's a nice thought to think that your dead relatives are looking down and stuff, but but I really don't believe scripture bears that out so let's examine that now first <coughs> we've all heard like I said like I just mentioned the word hell right we've all heard that word burning hell and people preachers go and repent now sinners are going to hell or something right <coughs> well there's different words that that word hell was the hell replaced the word hell was replaced replaced a few different words right like we see in a King James and other versions so we're going to examine where that one word hell, or the three different words got turned into one word. And we're going to see what that doctrine hell means. <clears throat> we're going to know what that word represents. Okay. Anyway, the first place we s I think we see this is in the Song of Moshe. Where one of these words is found, I mean, the word Sheol. So let's look at that. Chapter 32, verse 22. Deuter I'm sorry, Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 22. This is the song of Moshe. For a fire was kindled in my wrath and burns to the bottom of Sheol and consumes the earth and its increase and sets on fire the foundations of mountains. So the word Sheol. <clears throat> if you take a King James, for example, it, it, like I said, that's one of the words that was replaced with the word hell, right? <clears throat> but let's look at what Sheol says in the Hebrew. <clears throat> so that's in the Strong's H7, 7592, which basically means the grave, right? Or the pit or resting place. No mention of eternal torment yet, right? <clears throat> and also... You can kind of see James Strong throws the word Hades in there. I think that's just kind of uh, a little bias, a little bit of bias from the from Greek translations, kind of throwing that in there. But we'll get to that. We'll get to how that uh, how that fits in. <coughs> yeah, and we can see how this uh, idea of eternal torment and torture kind of got worked in, <coughs> but. But anyway, we'll get we'll get more to that. Um, but I want to go with uh, where he says he slept with his fathers, right? <clears throat> like King David, when when he died, he was telling Solomon, "Follow Yahweh's ways, be wise." And then, uh, script what does Scripture say in First Kings two ten? It says, "And David slept with his fathers." So we see this again. This term kind of keeps coming. You know, and uh, when his son Solomon died, we see the same thing in First Kings eleven forty three, and it says he slept with his fathers. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So, we see the same thing repeated. Someone dies, and they slept with their fathers, and it goes on through all the kings of Israel. It says that died, slept with their fathers. <clears throat> And we know that King David's going to be on earth again, right? So if he was, he's going to be resurrected in the kingdom. So we know that if, they're, if, if, they, if you die and you're in your eternal resting place right now or wherever you're going to go, then how would that be true? Why would David be coming back, right? <clears throat> and we see this, you know, David being coming back to, uh, coming back to earth, resurrected in Jeremiah, Hosea, Ezekiel. <clears throat> And those are the three places I found anyway. <clears throat> so, 
just to just to help under help you understand that where this is going anyway. <clears throat> so another word that was replaced with the, or that the hell the word hell replaced was Gehenna, which is in the Greek um, one zero six seven in the Strong's, which is actually described as a valley of Jerusalem. You see, they're taking they're take someone took that word a valley of Jerusalem and turned it into the word hell also. So you can kind of see. Oh, these are two, oh, these are two different things that were uh, that the hell the word hell replaced, and we know the valley of Gehenna is in Jerusalem, because first of all we see it uh, in Joshua, right? He was mapping out the areas that uh, certain tribes of Israel would inherit, right? And this was uh, part of uh, the tribe of Judah's territory, <coughs> so it's a physical place on earth, right? Not a burning, tormenting place. <coughs> And uh, we see this used in uh, Matthew chapter 5, 22. So let's read that. <coughs> this word, Gehenna, or son of Hennem. There's a few different ways they pronounce it. <coughs> All right, so again, Matthew chapter 5, verse 22. Let's read that. But I say to you, whoever is wroth with his brother without a cause will be liable to judgment. And whoever says, and whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be liable to the Sanhedrin. But whoever says, you fool, shall be liable to the fires of Gehenna. <clears throat> so, since he's talking about a valley in Jerusalem, and not a burning hell. What is he talking about, right? <clears throat> well, we have sources to affirm that this place actually existed. This, well, obviously, this, Yahshua was talking about it. It's true. But there's a rabbi in the, uh, I forget his name here. <clears throat> David Ka Kahimi. It's hard to pronounce that. But he wrote a commentary describing this. We know that the Jewish people did pretty good in historical facts anyway, you know. <clears throat> but not just that. This garbage dump was also talked about in Isaiah chapter 30, verse 33. <clears throat> and it reads, Topeth was ordained of old, even for the sovereign it has been prepared. He has made it deep and large, its fire pit with much wood, the breath of Yahweh as a stream of burning sulfur. So that word Topeth, right, it's explaining, that it's explaining this dump was that. It's a... Uh, it's part of like the southeast valley, southeast of the valley of Gehenna, right? So just wanted to give some facts. That's what he's talking about. That's what they're describing. And even scripture has a few different places to help understand that. <clears throat> so what was he talking about, right? Why are you liable to the fires of Gehenna? Or as the King James will say, hell, right? Well, Gehenna fits better because it's like, uh, it's like destruction, right? It was a fire pit. They would throw bodies in there, garbage. It was a place that where things turned into ashes, right? Just like just like when you have a fire pit out back. Everything goes in full, but it go, turns into ashes. <clears throat> so <clears throat> another place we find this switch is in Revelation, chapter 20, verse 12 through 15. Now I'll just jump to that. <clears throat> And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from what was written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead who were in them, who were in it. And death and Sheol gave up the dead who were, with, who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to their works. And death and Sheol, notice, were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And if anyone was not found written in the book of life, they were thrown into the lake of fire. <clears throat> so there's something else to note, right? <clears throat> so the word Sheol was replaced with the word hell. So if that's 
if her, if that if the were if the lake of fire is hell and Sheol is hell also you know so hell was thrown into hell or death and Sheol were thrown into hell that just wouldn't make sense right <clears throat> you can see how things kind of got mixed up there too it's a uh, wouldn't make sense but <clears throat> one more place we find this uh, this switch here second Kepha. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. So let's read there. Second Peter chapter two verse four. <clears throat> For if Elohim did not spare the messengers who sinned, but sent them to Tartaros and delivered them into chains of darkness to be kept for judgment. <clears throat> or Tartaro, right? That's the word we're looking at. That's another one that got replaced. That the word hell replaced, right? We find this in uh, in the Greek, in the Strong in the Greek. This is a uh, five zero fifty twenty. Which means a place where you basically get incinerated is what I got out of it, or gone, right? I th and I think that's what's, what they're describing the lake of fire as, right? Just the, where everything is just destroyed and gone. <clears throat> so, you know, I think we can see that uh, when someone says you're going to hell or they're going to hell or whatever, I think that it doesn't have much basis. You know, we can take these words that were just explained and we can think, think of it like this. We'll say a can of Pepsi, right? We'll say that's the word hell. And uh, you got your Fanta Coke and Sprite over here. So we're saying <laughs> that uh, this is the same flavor as all of these, right? Kind of the same thing. These have different meanings. This has the same meaning as all of these. But when you look inside, you crack the can open, you see these are different flavors. So that just would not make sense. Right, so that just can't be. So we can kind of just about throw out that right there and look at and look at it and see there's something else going on. <clears throat> and let's look at resurrection, right? <clears throat> if we all were at our eternal destination as soon as we died, why would there need to be a resurrection also? So now let's look into resurrection, right? <clears throat> so let's look at Acts chapter twenty four and we'll go to fourteen through fifteen. <clears throat> And uh, usually when people ask, you know, what do you follow? Like my, uh, I think my stepsister just uh, asked me this the other day and we're talking about some scripture and she's like, what are you, a, Bap what are you, a Baptist? Or they all say, you're a Baptist or a Catholic or something. And I was like, well, here's what I like to say because this makes the most sense. <clears throat> um, so yeah, Acts chapter 24, verse 14 through 15. And we'll make our point though here. And this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, so I worship the Elohim of my fathers, believing all that has been written in the Torah and the prophets, having, having an expectation of Elohim, which they themselves also wait for. And here's the point I'm trying to make here, that there is to be a resurrection of the dead, both of the righteous and the unrighteous. And this I exercise myself to have your clear conscience towards Elohim and men always. So we see that every human being that's ever existed is going to have to go through a resurrection, right? Well, there's some people who won't have to taste death in the end, but the majority, right, are going to have to go, th have to die, go to Sheol, and then be resurrected. <clears throat> so maybe somebody might say, well, okay, the people that are, uh, that like David, right, who are going to come back, and we know this, well, they came back from heaven, right? They were sent back from heaven to do that. That's just what happened. Well, Yahshua has something interesting to say about that, just to make it clear that no one has gone to heaven yet besides him. So let's, uh, let's read that. This is John chapter 3. Yeah, let's turn to that because <clears throat> let's just get this glued in our eyeballs here. <clears throat> John chapter 3, verse 13.
Okay. And no one, and remember, and no one, nobody, has gone up into the heaven except the one who came down from the heavens, and that is the son of Adam. So we can see clearly here that no one has entered the heavens. People have had visions of heaven, of the, hev- of the third heaven like Shaul, but no one has gone up or come down except for one man only, and that's Yahshua. So we can see here, anybody, another point, anybody who has died so far, that's not what happened to them. They're not, as we'd say, down below or up above, right? They're in a resting place, waiting place, the grave. And it's very clear, very clear in many, many verses. <clears throat> but let's not stop there. <clears throat> and uh, another interesting thing, the book of Ecclesiastes makes another point. Um, let's turn there too. <clears throat> let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 5. Alrighty, again, Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 5. And look at this. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. They know nothing. Nor do they have any more reward. Their remembrance is forgotten. So they don't know anything, right? They're in a state of basically rest, stillness. So we see again another point here that we're not... um, not on harps, we're not on clouds playing harps yet, you know, stuff like that. And these, do- you know what I mean, the heaven and hell thing, I think it's, I think you're starting to understand here, right, <clears throat> what the scriptures are actually saying. And uh, if we go down to verse 10, right, he says, All that your hand finds to do, do it with everything you have. There's no knowledge or wisdom in Sheol where you are going. Sheol, the grave, right, the, the, pl- the place of rest or waiting. So the dead, we can see where the dead go, right, while they wait, <coughs> while they wait, while they wait for the resurrection. Clearly, nothing happens until then. <coughs> and another point, uh, some, another thing I want to bring up here. What's interesting about this? What happens when you die, and how's this going to work, right? What's even in the thousand-year reign? You know, this is this is something I found really, really interesting. I think a lot of people would like to. I think this bring this makes things make a lot of sense here. Um, if you've never heard of the, never heard of the dry bones prophecy, this is this is interesting. Um, you know Ezekiel in chapter uh, thirty seven one through thirteen, right? Yahweh says to him, "Look at these dry bones. Prophesy to these bones to come back to life." You know, these what happens is Yahweh is putting. He shows an example. He's going to put flesh and bones and skin, right? He's going to take skeletons. He's going to bring people that died back to physical life, right? He's going to put skin and skin on them, meat, flesh, he says, and everything, right? And we know who these are. He says uh, they're the armies of Israel. But uh, the point being, people are actually going to be resurrected from the dead and bring back to physical life. So it kind of makes more sense. <coughs> And uh, we have more examples of this. I think when Yahshua was teaching, he gave a little, a little sample of this, you know, very little samples of this exact thing. So let's turn to the Gospels. Let's go to Matthew, right? I think he gives a little taste of this because obviously he knew what the scriptures said, what the prophet said, the Torah said. So I really believe he's showing us a little sample of this again. So once again, let's go to Matthew chapter 27, verse 52 through 53. <clears throat> Keeping in mind the uh, putting, bringing people back to physical life when we read this, right? <clears throat> okay, Matthew 27, 52 through 53. <clears throat> All right. And the tombs were open, and many bodies of the set-apart ones who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the set-apart city and appeared to many. 
So after Yahshua, this is the only gospel that has that, by the way. It's in the gospel of Matthew. You know, right after he's uh, resurrected, right, we see that people who died before came out of the, remember, the grave, right? They came out of the grave, not out of the heavens or the hell, out of the heavens or hell or something, from the grave. So we know that's where they were. They were in a waiting place. So, I think I repeated this earlier, but once again, we're still wondering about our family and friends and people who never read a Bible. I know I repeated this earlier, but I want to get down into some of this some of these details again. I think this is important a lot for a lot of people to understand. You know, if you didn't know the truth, I'd, I'd say it's pretty clear that you're not going to be judged by judged by something you didn't know, right? I mean, it's be, Yahweh is way better than than the way our world does it. Like if you're if you go fishing in Michigan with a rusty hook and you don't know it, you can technically get a ticket. But I think Yahweh is much better than that, and we're going to see why. <clears throat> like if you don't know that you uh, can't use a rusty hook and DNR catches you. I didn't know. Well, you're still going to take it. Well, Yahweh's not like that, okay? He's better not talking about it with the DNR. I'm just saying it's just how it's set up. But Yahweh's better than that, and we're going to see why. So let's go to 1 Peter chapter 4, and we'll go to verse 17. First Peter chapter four and we'll go seventeen. <clears throat> because it is time for judgment to begin, first from the house of Elohim. So we see here the first people that are being judged, right? Are Yahweh's people, the people who understand the truth, the house of Elohim, right? His people. You know, and as we know, you can't fully understand the truth. You can't get in the, really the depths of truth unless you have the Spirit, right? Because we know the Scripture points out the Holy Spirit guides you into all the truth. And uh, so to get the Spirit, one must be baptized in Yahshua's name. We see the examples, right? Be baptized in Yahshua's name, and then the elders will lay hands on you, and the Spirit will enter you. We see that's an important um, detail, you know, like David when he was anointed king over Israel. The Spirit entered him from anointing, right? So just bringing my point. Getting this, this, that's how you receive the Spirit. So if you don't do that, you know, it might not, that, that's how we start our journey to getting into the truth, right? <clears throat> so anyway, <clears throat> back to where I was. So people who never touched a Bible, you know, innocent children that have been killed in world wars and people in Muslim countries that never even got to see scriptures, right? I, I think it's very fair to say they're not being judged yet. And there's more than one example we can see about that. <clears throat> so let's look at it again. I think Yahshua, or the book of Revelation brings this point up again. <clears throat> let's look at that. In chapter, uh, chapter 3, we'll go to chapter 3, and this is verse 15 through 16. Revelation. Okay. And he says, I know your works, that you are neither hot or cold. I would have it that you were, that, that you were cold or hot. So because you were lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. So what he's saying is, see, that makes the same point. <clears throat> cold or hot, I don't, I'd rather you cold or hot and not be lukewarm, you know? Being hot, right? You know Yahweh's ways, and you're running towards it, right? You know what the truth is, and you're saying, well, this is more important than, than my life and the things I want, right? Run towards it the best you can. If you're being cold, or if he says, you know, I'd rather you, if you're cold, right, I think it's fair to say that that's people who don't understand, right? And if you're lukewarm, there's plenty of places that mention this, you know, you, you, you kind of, you see, you see what the truth is, and you actually 
you know that you know it's the truth, right? But you're just saying, well, maybe this is too hard for me. Maybe I got, you know, again, my social groups are too great. I'd hate to give that up. I mean, not that you have to give up your social group, but if that gets in the way, right? Or if your job gets in the way, or if anything gets in the way, you know? I think things like that is, is what he's calling lukewarm. You know, don't let anything get in the way. If he knows the truth, chase it, run for it. Like Shaul says, right? Run. Run like you're running a race. <clears throat> but uh, let's dig a little more into, uh, into that topic anyway. Um, let's go to Second Peter, right? We'll start in chapter 2, which we were just there anyway. But Peter chapter 2, verses 20 through 22. Second Peter. For it would have been better for them, now get this, to not have known the way of righteousness, than having known it, and to turn from the set-apart command delivered to them. For, a pro- for the proverb has proved true, a dog returns to its own vomit, and a washed sow returns to, the, to her rolling in the mud. So we see, you know, he says, if you know, like I just mentioned before, if you know the truth, you know, and you say, well, I just... And mom loves Christmas, and she's sad. I'm, I'm not doing it, you know. Um, maybe, you know, sometimes you're guilted by, you know, family. A family member will guilt you even, you know. Your coworkers, maybe your mom and dad for whatever it is, you know. Don't if you know the truth, like he just states here, you know. Like I said again, run towards it. He says it's better, better to. Better you didn't know the truth than to not know it, right? So these people, anyway, these people that don't know the truth is my whole point here. I think he's clearly saying if they don't know it, how can they be judged by it? They're not, it's not the ones he's talking about. I mean, throughout scripture, when he's judging the people in these assemblies, these are people who, it seems, knew the truth, right? Or at least knew, knew some things that were right, and they were being tested with it, and they decided to turn away. You know, that's the ones he's, he's pronouncing judgment on or telling them, you know, how this is going to work out, right? So, he says this is pretty serious, you know, and even if you're looking into Yahweh's ways, you know, scripture even points out, you know, we need to count the cost, you know, you should think about it and, and see if we're able to go through with this, think about it, like, am I able to go all the way, like, even even if it costs you everything, even if it comes to death, I mean, right now it's we got it pretty good in that sense. We're not really being persecuted here in America. Well, maybe somewhat, but it's not that bad yet. And Scripture points this out: count the cost. Let's see if you know. Make sure you're willing to go all the way. And uh, the Gospels point this out. So let's check that out in the Book of Luke, right? Um, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 14. <clears throat> Oh, sorry, Luke 14, 27 through 28. <clears throat> All right. And whoever does not bear their stake and come after me is unable to be my taught one. For who of you wishing to build a tower does not sit down and first count the cost, whether they have enough to complete it or not? <clears throat> so the same point I just made, you know. Well, that's where I got it, obviously, but... He says even a king who goes to battle, you know, we can, we can, we can uh, consider it a battle, you know. If a king goes to battle, right, they would see, all right, do I have enough people? Do I got the resources? Do I have the technology or whatever it is they, do I have the advisors, you know, whatever it is. Do we have rut in ourself, you know? Do we, are we going to take it all the way? That's what he's saying, you know. So if you, to bring up the point again, if you don't know the truth, right, I firmly believe you're not being judged yet. But if you do, you know, let's take it all the way, right? 
So <clears throat> I think it makes sense. We all have a fair chance. But uh, let's bring up something again. Let's go to Revelation chapter 20. <clears throat> Even though we were just there, but chapter 20, verse 12 through 13. Actually, I just went over this. <clears throat> this is, uh, we'll be, oh, maybe I didn't. Well, let's read it anyway. <clears throat> and I saw the dead, small and great, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, the book of life. And the dead were judged from what was written in the books. So we see that the dead, small and great, right? We're being judged by what was written in the books and we know that the Bible is a it's full of books right this is about 66 books so that's what it has to be what he was talking about so if we don't know what's in them like like I've been bringing up this whole time you know how can we be judged by them right like the point I made earlier <clears throat> that makes a lot more sense than just well you know this kid in a Muslim country got bombed or had a bomb strapped to him you know or whoever else, you know. And then he's, whoop, sorry, he's gone forever. That's it. That was his chance. That's just, that makes zero sense with what the scripture actually points out and what it says. So the lake of fire, how does that work? <clears throat> Which I kind of mentioned this earlier, but we're going to bring another, a little more of a point to this anyway. <clears throat> so this is in Revelation 20, right? W which we already, I'll read, just read this. Death and Sheol were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death. <clears throat> so we don't see here that they're being destroyed, right? We see this is like a destruction. This is just a incinerated, basically. And we, and we see examples of this, right? Of this turn to ashes kind of thing and just gone, done, um, this is in Ezekiel. gives us an in, gives us a little insight to to this kind of destruction. So let's go to Ezekiel twenty eight nineteen. All who knew you among the peoples were astonished at you. Waste you shall be and cease to be forever. And I think this is talking about uh, Hasatan, right? He, kinda, he declares that he's going to be turned to ashes. And we know that he's thrown into the lake of fire. So he's, he called out here what's going to happen. He's going to be ashes. So we can see that it's not, he's not going to be tormented forever, right? He's just going to be thrown in the lake of fire, just like, just like the rest who, uh, you know, just totally refuse when they know the truth to follow Yahweh's ways. Not forever, not, he doesn't get eternal life. There's only one way to get eternal life, right? There's not two set, two kinds of eternal life. So, hope that makes that point clear. <clears throat> So, on that note, you know, I think we can take that to say that any unrighteous, like I just said, the end will be the same way, right? It's not a forever burning hell like I've repeated this whole time. And uh, I, hope, I hope that sermon helped you understand um, what happens when we die. Um, it was very important to me, so... <clears throat> and not just without my own bias even, just trying to understand. And I think that scripture really does point out that, you know, that just shows that Yahweh has more compassion than I think the, the world preaches he does. And not just from my want, you know, my, me wanting to be like that, but I really believe that's what scripture bears out. So I hope that, uh, I hope that helps you understand and gives you a little more faith and joy that uh, 
Yahweh's a lot better than he's been portrayed, I think, sometimes. So on that note, hallelujah. I hope it was a blessing to you.